Hi guys, my name is Sean. I'm a houseplant enthusiast from Jakarta, Indonesia. First of all, I want to wish you guys a happy holidays. I hope that you guys are staying safe and staying sane at home. Please do take care of yourselves and each other. We're almost at the end of the pandemic, so trust that things will get better next year. Today, I'm going to be getting together with Fern from Canada and our video collaboration today is going to talk about five houseplants that have either similar or very different care and availabilities in our region. So I hope that you guys are gonna find some of these interesting as we compare the species side by side. Hi everyone, my name is Fern. If you don't know me, I make videos all about houseplants on my channel Wild Fern and also post planty content on my Instagram at underscore Wild Fern. Before we get into this very exciting planty video, I just wanted to take a moment to wish you all a happy holiday. I know that this has been a very challenging year for almost all of us. It's been a very different year and I hope that you have all found a way to celebrate the holiday season or at least had a chance to relax, maybe spend some time with your plants and I hope that you are ready for a new year. So today I am so excited to be doing a collab with Sean of Only Plants here on YouTube and we are going to be discussing some differences and similarities and just our experience with five plants that we have chosen. I'm just so stoked about it because I live in Canada and Sean lives in Indonesia, so we live in completely different climates. And I'm always just so shocked when I'm watching his videos and seeing how his plants are growing. So I hope that you all enjoy seeing the two different perspectives and let's get right into the video. First one that we're gonna talk about is this Begonia maculata. And I actually have a huge specimen of this plant. I grew this from a baby. And the way that we would care for it here in Indonesia is to give it medium to bright indirect light. I would be careful not to give it too much direct sunlight as it will burn the leaves. And this plant here actually likes to be dried out completely between waterings. If you overwater it, the leaves will give you crisping edges, which is also a similar symptom if you underwater it, which is why it's really hard to tell. This plant is actually easy to rot here in our high humidity climate. So I need to be very mindful. I actually gave this plant a terracotta pot and very, very fast draining potting mix with a lot of perlite in it and make sure that it dries out completely between waterings. This one is actually living outdoors in really good airflow, which is why it's actually safe to water it every day. I actually had this plant indoors when it was a baby and actually had to moisture probe it every other day just to make sure that it's completely dry before I water it again. This plant is very, very susceptible to bacteria and fungus and you can see from the leaves if you have some spots that are brown, that's usually fungus. And I try my best not to get water on the leaves because water is also a way that you can harbor and spread bacteria and fungus. And in terms of pests, I actually have never had pest issues on this before, knock on wood. But I do spray it down with neem oil maybe once every six months or so with my other plants. And this is actually a plant that I really enjoy propagating both directly into potting mix and also in water. That's why I have quite a few pots of these. They are in smaller pots uh, on, in my nursery. So I really have a good history with this plant and I consider this to be a very fast grower. And I recommend this for people who are beginning with begonias who aren't sure with how to care for them because the other begonias are very similar in, in care, but this one is actually a little bit more fast growing and a little bit more forgiving than the other begonias. And this plant is actually very easy to find here in Indonesia. Wherever plants are sold, you can easily find these and they cost around 525 US dollars. And not a lot of people actually pick this up here because first of all, they're actually not easy to care for here because they tend to rot easily if you overwater it. And also this plant is really weird looking and I think people here generally are not really into that weird or unique looking foliage. People here tend to go for the leafy greens, leafy tropicals, aeroids and things like that. So this is definitely an underrated plant here that is um, that nobody really wants to pick up in the stores but they're very very available and everywhere we go. Okay, so the first plant that we're going to be discussing today is the beautiful Begonia maculata. As you can see, mine is quite large here. I've had it for a little while now and it has been super easy care, especially to compared to a lot of other begonias. So I give this plant um, between medium to bright indirect light. I've actually moved it around quite a lot. So it's received a lot of different types of lighting and it's done really well with all of them. Right now I have it on the second shelf um, below my grow lights. So it's getting like 
quite bright light and it's doing really well. As for the soil, I don't have it in anything really special. It's basically just a regular potting mix with added perlite for drainage and it seems to be doing really well. It's really not fussy. The only thing that this plant does demand from me is humidity. So I always keep this plant somewhat near a humidifier. Um, you can see on some of its original leaves that it came to me with, they are quite crispy, unfortunately, but pretty much all of the new growth um, since I have had it for, I've had it for almost a year now, and pretty much all the leaves that it's given me are beautiful and not crispy, so it really appreciates the humidifier. Now, I do usually let this plant get pretty dry. I would say I let it almost dry out entirely, um, but I don't let it stay dry for a long time. So as soon as I notice it get dry, I water it. And I would say that I water it probably between every one to two weeks, especially now because it's winter, it's not very warm here. So my plants really don't need to be watered that often. Oh, and for pests, I have not had any pest issues with this plant, knock on wood. But yeah, it's just been super easy going. The only thing that I would be concerned about with it is uh, fungal issues like powdery mildew. Actually, one of my other begonias has what I think is powdery mildew right now, and um, it is a chore to get rid of. So you really have to be aware of finding any spots on the leaves that look moldy or anything like that. But other than that, I do not struggle with pests on this guy. So for availability, I would say that these are pretty easy to find here in Canada. They do pop up at a lot of the stores every once in a while. However, I will say that they are very well loved, so they do usually go quickly. So if you're wanting one and you see one, I would definitely grab it. And for price, I paid about $16 US, which I think is a pretty standard price for these guys here. Of course, I live in Canada, but I have converted what I paid um, into US dollars for the purpose of this video. So yeah, I paid about 16 US dollars. And the next plant is this Alocasia Friedach. And this is actually Fern's pick. She really adores this plant and I do too. This plant is just so beautiful in its color. It's very unique and it's got these neon veins running through it. It's just a really interesting texture and no photograph can capture this plant or do it justice because it's just so different. And I actually give this bright indirect light with a little bit of direct sunlight and it seemed to grow faster that way compared to when I had it in medium indirect light. I do water this pretty often because this is in a fast draining aeroid potting mix with a terracotta pot. And this plant seems to explode in growth during the rainy season when it gets rained on every day. However, keep in mind that no plants like to be drowned or be doused with water. So be mindful with that. This plant needs to dry out, but maybe not completely like philodendrons or monsteras. They do want to have a little bit of humidity around the roots. In terms of pests, alocasias are very prone to spider mites. I don't remember if this particular one had spider mites before, but I do spray it down with neem oil every few months just to be sure and spray it on the front and the back of the leaves. I actually grew this plant from a tiny baby and when it was small, it didn't do much at all. Again, I had it sort of in medium light conditions and I did wait for it to dry out before I watered it again. Maybe that's why it wasn't really doing that much for me before. And now it's just putting out leaves after leaves. And I've actually seen these alocasias in nurseries here where it's got a main stem that grows upwards with some of the leaves that gets bigger and bigger in size as, as it grows upwards, which is suggesting to me that this plant may actually do well in moss pole. Of course, I'm not going to give it like a tall moss pole, but maybe like a 30 centimeters moss pole, because I feel like if it can really attach itself to something, it's got support, and it's aerial root can root into it, it's going to grow faster and it's going to give uh, us bigger leaves. I haven't seen many people growing these plants with moss poles, but that's just my instinct. So I'm going to give it a try and I will be sharing that with you guys. And this plant is considered rare here, but it's very, very attainable. A lot of shops do carry them. And if you look online, a lot of places do have them as well at an affordable price. And a plant around this size will set you back around 475 US dollars. So it's not going to really break your bank. Okay, so next up, we are going to be talking about the adorable Alocasia Frydeck. I hope that you guys can see okay, mine is tiny. 
I will insert some <laughs> close-up clips of him. But yes, mine is just a baby. I actually just got him this fall and he is down <laughs> to two leaves. And you can see this one is a little wonky. It was on its way out and then it really decided to make a comeback. So yes, and I think it's going to put out a new leaf soon as well. I actually put this plant into my greenhouse cabinet there as soon as I had it up and running. And since then it has totally perked up and stopped drooping. I mean, this one is trying to stop drooping. But yes, I was having some difficulties with this plant not being happy before I put it in the greenhouse cabinet. So that definitely tells me that it is appreciating the humidity in there. So yes, the care that I provide for this plant is in a very controlled environment. So it lives under grow lights that are on for probably about 12 hours a day and it gets ample humidity at about 80 to 90%, which is definitely more than um, most of my other plants that are not in the greenhouse receive. So he's really just getting the royal treatment in there, living his best life. As for watering, I do keep this guy nice and moist, which is pretty much the same with most of my alocasias. I usually water them probably about once a week right now, and that keeps the soil from drying out, and it usually keeps them quite happy. Like I said, it's not very warm here right now, so in the summer when there's more heat, I will probably be watering this guy every few days. And as for soil, I have him in a lovely mixture of orchid bark, charcoal, cocoa coir, perlite, and hummus. I think that he's gonna do well. I can actually, I repotted him probably about a month ago now, just under, and I can already see some of his roots popping up against the side of this um, clear orchid container. So, you know, I'm really crossing my fingers. I really want this guy to take off because these are amazing when the leaves are bigger. They're so beautiful. So I'm just so excited for that. And it's gonna be so cool to watch him grow. As for pests, since he is an alocasia, he is very prone to spider mites. So what I do is spray him with neem oil every month or two just to make sure, and I keep a very, very close eye on him just to make sure that no spider mites are popping up because I really do not want to have to deal with an outbreak. So no issues so far, but I do keep a really close eye for spider mites. As for availability, these would be considered rare or hard to get where I live, but the price tag is not very high, which is nice. So if you can find one, they're usually on the more affordable end of rare houseplants. So I paid about $27 US. I did have to pay for shipping as well though. So it would have totaled out to 40 something dollars US, but I was honestly happy to pay for that. And these do tend to go for even more than that. So it just depends what the market is like, but I am really glad to have him in my care. The next plant is a Hoya Macrophylla variegata, and this is actually one of my favorite Hoyas. To be honest, I picked this plant because I wanted to talk about it, uh, and I wanted to see how Fern takes care of her Hoya Macrophylla variegata. I do give this plant some direct sunlight, and as you can see, that will encourage faster growth and also this really beautiful pink rims around the leaves when it's sun stressed. It's really beautiful. And this plant needs to be dried out between waterings but I do give it terracotta pot and a very, very fast draining potting mix here that is amended with perlite and bark. Therefore, I do water this every day because it lives outside and it gets really good airflow and really good sunlight. This plant is unstoppable with that combination because it just keeps growing and growing and I've taken so many cuttings and giving it to people and I have many pots of this plant around the house too because I just enjoy seeing them around. And this plant is actually very, very prone to mealybugs. They love, love being around the new leaves. They like eating them So Sometimes the leaves don't even unfurl properly. They just get attacked by this white fuzz. When it's living outdoors, there's a lot of predatory insects that would actually feed on the mealybugs. But when it's kept indoors, I have to be very, very mindful of that. And I actually have this plant grown in my west window here on my bedroom. And it grew really fast, so it grew really well. So I would say that this is a plant that is not really swayed by humidity because it's actually super humid outside here in Indonesia. It's about 80 to 90% humidity. So this plant is actually very strong. In terms of humidity, they don't really require it. And I really, really love the venation on these leaves. It's just so stunning. I love to pet it. The texture is just really beautiful. And I hope that you guys can 
pick up one of these and the variegations are very very inconsistent very very irregular the shape sometimes is also very interesting on the leaves it's just quite a character to have and it's put out this long tendril that is going to try to grab onto other things although usually when i have a plant like this i do cut off the tendrils i know that you guys are against it but when you do cut off the tendrils new vines will appear from lower from from the lower node and it will give me a bushier plant because i'm actually not growing these for the flowers i'm growing these more for the foliage for the dense thick bushy foliage and one more reason why i love this hoya and most hoyas is because because they're so easy to propagate. You can just take a single node cutting and just root it and it will grow really reliably for you. And this plant is actually very, very easy to find here in Indonesia, although you do have to look for it a little bit because Hoyas are not a popular plant in Indonesia, sadly. Uh, people here are more into the aeroids and things like that. So I hope that they do gain in popularity someday here. And this plant actually costs around $4.25 for a small size, uh, maybe a few leaf uh, cuttings. So it's not terribly expensive here in Indonesia. Okay, so next we're going to be talking about this guy right here, which is Hoya Macrophylla variegata, and it is a very beautiful Hoya. This is actually Sean's pick. He loves this plant, and you know what? I love it too. So in my home, pretty much all of my Hoyas grow really well and I have really minimal problems and that's pretty much the same story with this guy. He is so low maintenance. I barely pay any attention to him if I'm being completely honest. I recently gave him this trellis just to give him something to climb, you know, in hopes that he um, gives me some more leaves on these tendrils of his. So I'm hoping that he likes that. He hasn't been on it for very long, so we'll see what happens. But um, usually Hoya do like to climb, so I think that he's going to enjoy it. Okay, so for light for this plant, it does prefer a bright indirect light. Um, however, I, to be completely honest, was not giving it great light. I was probably giving it like maybe medium light for quite a while. I've just recently moved it into more light. Um, so as you can see, the edges of mine are just a cream color, but if you give them high lighting conditions, they sun stress and get a beautiful pinky red border. So I'm hoping that we can get some pink on this plant, but yeah, you can definitely get away with a medium kind of lighting for this, but it's just not gonna get that sun stressing that a lot of people really love in Hoya. As for watering, I really do not water this plant often at all. I actually just watered it before this video and that was probably the first time I watered it in about a month. So it was definitely due, but it wasn't really complaining that I hadn't watered it in so long. Um, its leaves are quite soft and bendy and that is how I knew it was time for a water, but it's, it wasn't really like showing any, any negative signs or anything like that. So it's really a resilient and easy care plant in my experience here. As for the soil mix, I potted this quite a while ago and it's just like a regular all-purpose potting mix with some added perlite and it is in this kind of cement pot. As for humidity, I know that a lot of Hoya really do enjoy a higher humidity. However, I don't think it's necessary. I've never really noticed any negative effects from not giving this guy high humidity. He is next to a humidifier now, but I have always grown him in the past without being near a humidifier and he's done perfectly fine. So I think really either way you can get away with for this guy. And as for pests, I luckily have not had any pest issues on this. Um, usually my Hoya do not get pests. Knock on wood, I am probably jinxing myself now, but I really have not struggled with pests on most of my Hoya. And that's the same with this guy. Never had an issue, so let's hope that that just keeps on going. As for availability, these are really not common plants here. I don't know if I have ever seen one for sale where I live, and I don't see them online very often either. I wouldn't say they're super rare. They, they, I just don't come across them very often. I actually picked this one up when I was traveling in the US last year. So I bought it as just a two leaf plant actually. So it's um, grown quite a bit for me. And I paid, a, I believe about $15 US for this guy. So um, not a bad price. So the next plant is this Calathea orbifolia. And this plant actually likes medium to bright indirect light although i would keep it more to the medium light uh, side because they are very easy to burn and the leaves can curl up if it's a little bit too 
sunny for them. And this plant is a huge challenge to grow here in Indonesia. I actually killed two of them already and I keep buying them because I keep killing, killing them. I have two right here in my hand. So this one seems to be doing quite okay, but the problem is with watering here. These plants actually rot really easily in high humidity, so their potting mix need to be constantly humid, but never wet. It cannot be soggy wet at all. So this plant needs to be dry out very, very quickly here in Indonesia. I put it in a terracotta pot, I give it a very loose and airy potting mix and I water it very frequently, but very lightly. This is to keep it humid around the roots. And they seem to really like that. And this plant is actually relatively pest free in my experience. I haven't had any pest issues with this. However, I have grow all my Calatheas outdoors. That's why I'm a little bit biased. I can imagine though that if I brought this inside, it's probably going to be attacked by spider mites very quickly because this is a plant that seemed to really love humidity and stressed out very easily. You do have to keep an eye out for this plant. And they're actually very easy to kill here, which is why they're considered very expensive here in Indonesia. Calathea orbifolia at this small size will cost around 28 US dollars and this is actually very expensive for Indonesian plants because our plants here are generally quite inexpensive to begin with and the orbifolia I guess are a little bit slow to grow and again I think a lot of people do kill it because I know I did kill a lot of these they're just so prone to rot so yeah they're quite easy to find otherwise they're not considered rare but again you do have to fork out a little bit of money to buy one of these Okay, next we are going to be talking about Calathea orbifolia. I love this plant so much. This is definitely one of my favorite Calathea. I was so excited when I finally came across one in a plant store where I live. So as for the care that I provide this plant, um, for lighting, I give this about a medium light now. It is receiving light from my grow lights, but it's quite a ways away from them. It was closer before, and I noticed that the leaves were getting almost like bleached looking, like they were just were looking very light. So I decided to move it away, and um, I'm trying that out now because I like like the darker kind of foliage. I just find it more striking on these guys. So I think the lighting was just a little too high. So I would definitely say like a medium indirect light for these guys in my experience. And for water, kind of similar to Alocasia, Calathea like to stay somewhat moist. So I pretty much treat it the same as I would my Frydeck, honestly. So I tend to try my best to keep the soil somewhat moist. They do not like to completely dry out. So I probably water this about once a week as well, just to make sure that it's not getting too dry on me. Um, as well, they like a higher humidity. This, I honestly care for this Calathea, the same as my Alocasia, very similar. So they do like a higher humidity. I do not have it living in the cabinet, um, but I do have it in my plant room where there's a humidifier running and the humidity is about, I would say an average of like 65%, which is pretty good for here, honestly, um, in the winter in my house here in Canada, because the heat's running, it's very dry. So it's important for me to have my humidifiers running around my plants. If I don't run my humidifiers, then the humidity can drop below 50%, which, you know, nobody really likes around here. So um, yes, humidity is definitely important. Um, you will get some crisping, which this one actually does have a little bit of crisping on some of the leaves. Um, and that was just probably a humidity issue. As for pests, Similarly, again, I am watching these guys like a hawk for spider mites. I do my prophylactic neem spray treatment on it, you know, every month or two, um, just to try to prevent an outbreak from happening because they are prone to them. So I just check out the leaves usually when I water it and make sure all is well. As for availability, these are not super available here, but they do pop up every once in a while. I had been looking for one and not seen one at all. And then randomly some of the shops started getting them in. So I was able to snag one. So I paid about 10 US dollars for this plant. I think it only had like three leaves when I bought it. It put out like four new leaves within the first month of me bringing it home. So I think it's quite happy. Finally, we have this Philodendron Melanochrysum. I give this guy medium to bright indirect light. It doesn't seem to like direct sunlight at all. It's gonna burn very easily. And if you give them lower light, they will have leggier stems. They will etoliate and they will grow pretty slowly. And this one needs to be dried out completely between waterings. 
because if you do overwater it, it's very easy for the leaves to yellow up and fall off. And unlike other philodendrons, which is very forgiving with humidity, I find that this species is very, very demanding in terms of humidity. If you give it lower humidity, some of the leaves will fail to unfurl. It's very similar to the varicosum, in fact. So if you're living in you know, a non-tropical climate with lower humidity, I would definitely have to do some humidity hack, like a grow tent uh, for these guys. Otherwise, they grow really fast if you give it the right conditions. And this is a plant that really needs a moss pole to climb onto. They will grow bigger and faster. I've had a smaller version of this plant grown indoors before and it was attacked by spider mite. So this plant is probably very prone to spider mite. It was also a plant that really didn't manage to unfurl properly because maybe I brought it back from the nursery where it got really optimal humidity and into my bedroom where the humidity dips to around 50% and it just probably wasn't happy. So now I have this just living outdoors where it's having its best life where I don't have to worry about humidity. I actually bought this plant when it was small, it was probably about uh, this tiny at around 1050 US dollars. But now a plant this size is going to cost around 75 US dollars here in Indonesia. They are quite easy to find uh, they're not, and they're not terribly expensive here, but they have uh, the prices have soared a bit over the pandemic. And as you can see here, I'm actually going to be propagating this plant. I have given it an air layering here with sphagnum moss because what happens with this plant generally is that they will lose some of the lower leaves. So it will give you one leggy stem with like a, a top here with a lot of bigger leaves. I don't know if I like that tree form. So I'm going to propagate it and start the big leaves uh, all over again from below. And I'm going to be cutting the individual nodes here. Some of them can be you know, good for a wet stick propagation or can just multiply this plant very easily actually. And I do notice that when you give this plant high humidity, the aerial roots will form like crazy, which is going to be very easy for me to propagate this plant. Okay, last but definitely not least, we have Philodendron Melanochrysum. Let me see if I can move it over here. This plant is on like the tallest moss pole ever. <laughs> It's not even all gonna fit in the frame, but it's so tall because I just added an extension to it. Um, my philodendron at Milano Chrysum recently started climbing and actually attaching itself to its moss pool, but it outgrew it so fast, so I had to build an attachment. But um, yes, and it's also very unsturdy. I have it in a plastic pot, which was a mistake. Um, it definitely needs to be repotted into terracotta in the springtime because it's so top heavy because of this pole. I have to have it leaning against something or else it is just going to fall over. But anyways, about this plant. Okay, so this is one of my favorite plants. And this one is just a juvenile. As you can see, it doesn't really have the um, classic Milano Chrysum long velvety leaves. If you look at Sean's, oh my God, it's so beautiful. But mine is just, just a wee baby, but that's okay. I still love it so much and it's so nice to see it grow up. The good thing about these is that they are very fast growers. So it's just grown so much. I've honestly only had it for about half a year now and it's um, just taken off. So the care for this plant, I provide it with, I would say a medium indirect light. It also gets light from my grow lights. I grow most of my plants under grow lights, you guys, because I live on Vancouver Island here in Canada and it's very rainy. Uh, a huge portion of the year. So my plants need that extra help, but I grow it um, next to one of my plant shelves with the grow lights. So it kind of gets an indirect medium light from those. And it's very happy for watering. It's not very fussy at all. I usually just water it when I notice it's dry. Most philodendrons in my care are quite easy and forgiving when it comes to watering. And I'm not, and I'm not too specific about it. I usually just water it, you know, once I notice that it is pretty much completely dried out, then I give it a very thorough drench, which tends to be probably about once a week. 
As for soil, I just have it in a similar potting mix to most of my other plants that I've discussed with a lot of perlite for drainage. The thing that is important for this plant in my experience is humidity. So something that happens with this guy when he's trying to unfurl leaves, they can get stuck and have difficulty emerging and because of that they can come out really damaged. So how I mitigate that is by giving this plant a lot of humidity. This sets this sits right directly next to my humidifier and the mist basically blows on the new leaves that are coming out and it really likes that. I used to always take a spray bottle and spray the new leaves when they were unfurling and keep them very moist so that they could kind of emerge smoothly and that worked well but now having it right next to my humidifier is a really good solution. As you can see it is on a moss pole because these guys love to climb and as they climb up they will start getting those large beautiful leaves. I'm really excited to see this guy keep climbing up his pole and as for pests I have not had any serious pest issues. I did recently have I was suspecting spider mites on this plant so I did give it a complete neem oil treatment and I don't see any anymore so that's good but yeah I was really worried about its like delicate velvety leaves that's the only thing that I have dealt with for this plant as for availability these would be considered rare here where I live. They are not something that pops up in your local plant shops. You typically have to order them online or import them or buy them from a plant collector that you know, which is what I did. Um, I got mine from another local plant person and these can actually be quite expensive. I paid, I think it worked out to about 47 US dollars for this plant as a baby. I have seen them sold for up to 140 US dollars for a baby tiny plant of this. So I would definitely say that out of all the plants I've spoken about, this one is the most expensive and hardest to obtain. Okay, so I hope that you guys found this video interesting because the care of plants can be very different depending on where you live. And I want to thank Fern again for doing this video with me. You can check out her Instagram at underscore wild fern or her youtube channel at wild fern to check out some of her videos and i want to remind you guys that even if we are really far away from each other we're all connected in this in our love for plants in our pain in our sorrow in our perseverance against this uh, very troubling times i hope that you guys are staying safe happy holidays i'm at botanist on instagram if you want to dm me on any questions regarding plant care and propagations and i see you guys in the next video i guess bye